Welcome. I'm Kate Chubbuck, Vice President for Education here at the New York Botanical Garden. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this special event on the DuPont Gardens of the Brandywine Valley. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the New York Botanical Garden is located in the ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. We honor them and acknowledge their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. Today, we are absolutely thrilled to participate in the book launch for the stunning DuPont Gardens of the Brandywine Valley by two very good longtime friends of the New York Botanical Garden, garden historian Marna McDowell and landscape photographer Larry Letterman. Marna McDowell is an esteemed faculty member in our Landscape Design Certificate Program here at NYBG. She is also a celebrated author whose books include Emily Dickinson's Gardening Life, Unearthing the Secret Garden, and most recently, my favorite, Gardens Can Be Murder, which seems an incredibly appropriate title for Halloween, about the connection between crime writing and gardening. In 2019, Marta was the recipient of the Garden Club of America Sarah Chapman Francis Medal for Outstanding Literary Achievement, and we are incredibly honored to have her as a longtime faculty member here at the Garden. Marta is joined today by Larry Letterman. Following a successful career in corporate law, Larry turned to photography as a profession. From initial focus on the forms and foliage of trees, Larry now captures the beauty of gardens and landscapes throughout the seasons. He is the author of many books, including Magnificent Trees of the New York Botanical Garden, The Rockefeller Family Gardens, and Garden Portraits. Experiencing Natural Beauty, which are all published by Monticelli, and he is the principal photographer for the 125th anniversary edition of the New York Botanical Garden. This year, we were also very excited to welcome to NYBG the very first Larry Letterman Photography Fellow for our Humanities Institute, and applications are now open for 2024 if you are an aspiring landscape photographer. The New York Botanical Garden has been extremely grateful to serve as muse for many of Larry's evocative photos and also to display his work in our classrooms on the third floor of the Watson Education Building, as well as in the special exhibit now on view in Ross Gallery. And we hope that you had the chance to admire Larry's photos as you uh, came into Ross Hall for this lecture. For our event, both Marta and Larry will present briefly, and then we will be joined for a panel discussion moderated by Todd Forrest, the author Ross, Vice President for Horticulture and Living Collections here at NYBG, as well as Jeff Downing, Executive Director of the Mount Cuba Center, a beautiful botanical garden that is featured in Larry and Marta's book. So without further ado, please take a moment and silent your cell phones, check them, make sure they are truly off, and join me in welcoming to the stage Marta McDowell. Thank you, Kay. This is a story of five gardens in images and words, and it's the story of a family. And the family arrived in America on January 1st, 1800, aboard a ship called the American Eagle, and it docked that day in waters off Newport, Rhode Island. And it didn't take long for the de facto head of the family Eleuther Irene DuPont, who I shall from now on call E.I. DuPont, to find a new location for the family home. And that was along the Brandywine Creek. It rises in southeast Pennsylvania. It runs a course of about 60 miles. But the area that E.I. DuPont selected was in Delaware, and it's right along the fall line, which is eight miles of fast moving water as the stream moves down to the coastal plain. And it was there that he started building his first mill. This was a mill to uh, create black powder, high quality black powder. And it really flourished, and it was the wealth from that manufacturing that really fueled generations of DuPont gardens. E.I. DuPont built his first family home above Brandywine Creek and above the mill. And here's a period picture of it. His son added the two wings on either side. So it was a fairly simple home. Uh, but he felt the lack of a garden. He 
planted trees from the beginning. And about a year after they moved into the house, so around 1803, he gets a huge shipment of plants from a friend in France and plants his potager. And I just love this picture that Larry took of the espalier fruit trees on the left. And then the pruning on the right is called anconoia, which means like a spindle. And when they're fresh pruned, it really does look like a spindle. So I think of the DuPont gardens, these five, or depending on how you count them, six gardens as really encapsulating American garden history, especially in terms of its influences from Europe. So this is certainly French from where the DuPonts came, and also French is Nemours, kind of at the other end of the spectrum from that simple potager this was one of E.I. DuPont's grandchildren. His name was Alfred. Alfred set out to build himself a show place between 1909 and 1910. He got the architect Thomas Hastings to design it. Thomas Hastings, career in Hastings, very famous New York architecture firm. Uh, Thomas Hastings once said something to the effect of, if the house is the main course, then the garden is the sauce. And what a sauce uh, he created. <laughs> it is, as one reporter said, in the 1930s, like a day in old France to visit Nemours. Well, old France, I suppose the France of like Louis XVI, because the inspiration was said to have come from the Petit Trianon. Here the Allée, uh, there the grand vista of the front of the house. So there we have France in the Baroque, then we can sort of switch over to Renaissance Italy, or at least as Renaissance Italy was interpreted in the first decade of the 20th century, because one of Alfred's cousins, Pierre Samuel DuPont, who had this little property he acquired and called Longwood, uh, visited this garden outside Florence. It's the Villa Gambaria, a Renaissance garden that was redesigned in the early 20th century and added on to, including those beautiful water parterres. Pierre saw this, he came back to Longwood, and he had to design an Italian water garden of his own. Uh, he was quite a capable engineer. He also loved hydraulics. He also visited the Villa Gori near Siena, and they had an outdoor theater. So of course, he comes back to Longwood and opens his outdoor theater, complete with fountains, in 1914. They had the first party. He invites friends and family. He invites business associates. And the local newspaper wrote this up. They said, just at dark, electric lights were turned on, simultaneously illuminating the stage. The program was a frolic by harlequins who, much to the surprise of the guests, danced among them, throwing confetti and garden roses and then winding their way out in a path of light, finally disappearing amid the trees. So if you think of Pierre, think of impresario. He liked to put on a show. And the show of shows at Longwood was his grand main fountain terrace. It debuted in 1931. This was two decades before Walt Disney constructed Disneyland. Even in the 1930s, it was lit with colored lights. It's had several renovations since then, and the most recent one means that it is now LED lighting and computer controlled and it is quite a spectacle to see one of their evening performances. Also hailing from Italian influences was the second stage of the garden at that original DuPont property, which was called Eleutherian Mills, now it's called Hagley. And between the 1920s and the 1950s, yet another one of these cousins, so grandchildren, uh, 
acquired this property as another country house close to the family home and the original homestead. And she and her husband put in this garden. This was Louise DuPont Crown and Shield and her husband Francis Boardman Crown and Shield. They wanted Italianate, this kind of idea of Italian, but romantic, almost like Pompeii had been unearthed and carted to Delaware. So love this painting that was done uh, in the late 1930s. And there are Francis and Louise down at the bottom right with a few of their dogs. Now that garden is in a state of gradual decay. It's it's sad, and yet it's quite magical to visit. I will say it is not all open to the public, so Larry's pictures give you a wonderful window into it. It's our great hope that as a result of this book, the money will be found to just make it stable because it is absolutely haunting and beautiful just a couple images of it. They took ideas from their travels in Europe and from actual sites and put them together in this hillside garden. Then they didn't forget about England in terms of these DuPont gardens. And I always think that Capability Brown, that 18th century designer, would be super pleased with places like Winter Tour, where you get those wonderful long views punctuated by something that catches the eye. And those wonderful managed water features, such as these at Nemours. Alfred DuPont was also quite a hydraulic engineer. Pierre Samuel DuPont at Longwood had his cascade, and Capability Brown loved his cascades. And then, of course, we get to the English flower garden. This was Pierre Samuel DuPont's first very simple flower garden walk. Uh, it was done right around 1910, and it's still absolutely gorgeous today. So I think of this more like Gertrude Jekyll with those wonderful cottage gardens. That's also reflected at Nemours, where you have the Four Borders Garden, and at Mount Cuba, where Marion Coffin designed this terrace garden that in the 2000s was all replaced in terms of plantings with native plants in line with Mount Cuba's objectives. And speaking of Marion Coffin, she worked most closely with Henry Francis DuPont at Winter Tour. So when he inherited the mansion and the grounds, he decided to build a big addition for all of his American furniture and related collections, and he called his old fam family friend, Marion Coffin, to do the estate design. And so she really connected the parts of this garden to the new, now nine-story house that was the Winter Tour Mansion and just made a beautiful job of it. But of course, Winter Tour is most famous for the plantings. And that was really Henry Francis DuPont himself. He was quite the plantsman. And you'll see more of Larry's wonderful images as well. But this sort of segues into the wild garden. Again, that sort of late, uh, you know, 1800s, 1900s rather, into the early 20th century. And that also fits well with Mount Cuba that started out as really a cornfield and Lamont DuPont Copeland was in the next generation. So he was a great grandchild and he and his wife, Pamela, uh, created this wonderful wild garden going down the slope of their property. It's just magnificent in the spring, but absolutely gorgeous in any season. And they were really ahead of their time because by 1965, they were already talking about concentrating on native plants. This is before Earth Day. And by the 1980s, they had expanded that to native plants of the Piedmont. And with that, I'll invite Larry up to show you more of his just exquisite inviting photographs. Thank you. 
It's a pleasure to be here, and I feel that I'm amongst friends since I spend so much time here. Um, <clears throat> you may see me around, uh, an odd-looking man with a, with a tripod. <clears throat> um, uh, this is the cover of the book, and uh, I think it's, we chose it because it's a remarkable cover in that it says something which, it has a point of view, and the point of view is that it, this is a wild garden. It's a winter tour, and you can see the magnificent trees, and you can see the plantings, which are really very high, and there's a path. So in a sense, you have a, an entree into it, and that's the entree into the book itself. Um, we're, we, we begin with a winter tour, and the house is huge. It, uh, Martha says nine stories, it has 100 rooms, and this is one of my favorite photographs of the house because for me, it shows the yin and the yang of, uh, the, <clears throat> of Henry and uh, his, his two loves, which are antiques in the house, which is a grand museum, and in the plantings itself, and the house just sort of peeks out and you're into his woodlands, which he uh, devoted his total energy to, I think more than he did his antiques. Uh, <clears throat> this is the, uh, the Glade Garden, and uh, it was designed by uh, Marion Coffin. He was very fortunate. He went to the uh, School of Animal, Animal Husbandry at uh, Harvard, and uh, she was there. Uh, <clears throat> learning about uh, horticulture, and they met, and uh, they may have known each other. I'm not sure, uh, but uh, they worked together then for, uh, for, for their, it was a lifetime partnership, in effect. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, a, uh, the reflecting pool, and I, I took this shot at an angle to show the reflection, to give a sense of the flowering here, uh, which is basically, it was, a, it was the family pool, but it became a reflecting pool uh, after the family stopped using it. And it has azaleas, dogwoods, and viburnum. It's chock full of flowers. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, uh, the red buds in the spring on a path to the quarry garden. All the photographs have a point of view and they lead you into uh, where uh, where the action is. So this pathway around gets to the bridge and you're overlooking the quarry garden, which is our next slide. And this is the quarry garden in the spring. Uh, <clears throat> it's The spring at Winterthur is, is wonderful. It's beyond imagining. And uh, it's known for its March Bank, which we'll get to a little later. This is Clenny Run, which is a tributary of uh, the uh, Brandywine. And uh, so we're showing flowing water, uh, which runs all throughout the property. Um, this is a gazebo, and I took this not really because of uh, its great uh, architectural qualities, but it's, it's a point in the landscape, it's a place to travel to, and off to the left is the Magnolia Bend, which is famous with the magnolia tree blossoming at, at a bend in the road. But this point uh, helps you to see uh, a sense, giving you a sense of place in the landscape, as you'll see. This is the uh, sundial garden. Uh, the uh, the <clears throat> Flowering quince are beyond imagining. Um, when you get there in the season, you say, what are they? What are they? I mean, of course, they're like trees. Um, my wife asked me if we could take some. <laughs> and I said, I wish. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you can see through, and you can see the sundial itself, that whole area is decorated with flowers and with a, uh, a sort of a maze that you walk through and gives you a sense of place. 
this is really a the March Bank, and it it is exquisite in the sense that uh, when I begin the project, uh, I was called about it in the winter in January, and I and uh, it took about a week uh, to uh, get the five families together. They had never worked together, but they thought this would be a wonderful project and about a week to get Monticelli to be involved. And uh, I, I got down there as soon as I could because I knew I had to get there before March to get experience the March Bank. And here it is. You can see the size of the trees. They're glorious. Uh, these, are, um, <clears throat> these are poplars um, and uh, tulip trees. And they're straight as arrows. And the under, under planting with ephemerals is just, uh, it, it, it's, it's beyond belief. We're now traveling to Nemours, and this is uh, the gate at Nemours. I took it uh, through the gate to give a sense of the depth and of the, of the, the gate was not only announcing uh, this gold leaf wonder, but was also giving you a sense of where you were going because you could see the fountain and that you were going into another world. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this gate uh, is 18th century and was once installed at the Wimbledon Manor outside of uh, London. This is a maze on the long walk. Uh, I shot it to give you uh, a view of the house, but from the, from the maze and, and give you a sense of the plantings so that it's not an ordinary long walk. Uh, you, you enter by degrees and you, uh, you travel through a, a, a series of different gardens that uh, engage and distract. This is the long walk, and this is the December uh, version where uh, you have Christmas candles and so forth. They change it all year so that it is never quite the same. It's seasonal, and you can have a sense of the fall foliage here. There was no snow that year, much to my dismay. Uh, <clears throat> I ordinarily don't shoot down the center, but the, the key here is the, uh, the tree. Uh, this is where Henry, uh, rather, this is where Alfred stood with his father. And his father said, you should build a house here. And so that tree is venerable and was there before anything else existed. This is the Humpback Bridge, and um, uh, Nemours is distracting for its elegance, but it has this wonderful quality to it of also being um, decorated by, by the plantings so that the, uh, the structures don't outweigh the plantings. The plantings sort of add and carry you through, and the garden is what really uh, makes it uh, th this totally French and, and glorious garden. <clears throat> Again, I took the, uh, the photograph of, of the colonnade uh, from the, the canners to give a sense that uh, no matter the structures, there are plantings all around and uh, there's, there's pleasure in, in, in every part of the wall. I love this photo because the, the point of interest is right here in the, on the right-hand side, the horse chestnut trees and the chestnut blossoms. But if, if your eye follows it through, you get to the Temple of Love, and, uh, which is usually what people photograph. But here, it's sort of the end point in a, in a lovely walk. Um, this is... Um, a, the uh, full foliage on the long walk, uh, the path. 
uh, where the LA is, uh, which was pictured by Marta, and we'll show uh, pictures of the LA in a little while. Uh, these, uh, um, and there is a garden on the other side, which we also show pictures of. So uh, this is the uh, sunken garden. It's travertine marble and the colonnade structure and Carrara marble for the sculpture. Uh, this is, these are canners and golden privet. I love the privet. This is in the maize garden. It helps give the structure to the maize. That is a real LA. And the interesting thing is, when you talk to photographers, they say, you should never shoot in midday. Well, the only time you can get that, those kind of shadows is in midday. So, um, I mean, um, every rule has to be broken. Otherwise, there, there's no fun. <laughs> the, um, this is the, uh, the, the garden of Asian influence, and, and the trees here are magnolias. They don't look like magnolias, but they, when they're in blossom, they're gorgeous. Um, the structure is interesting, and you walk down the stairs, and, you're, and you, it leads you to the pond and the colonnade. We are now in a Pearson house, uh, which is uh, a Pearson house. Uh, this is on at Longwood, and uh, the I took it through uh, the magnolia tree. But what I liked about the magnolia tree was that the upper branch really mimics the lower branch it, with this odd, odd shape, and it has its own structure. And the house sort of disappears, but yet is a point of attention. <clears throat> Longwood is blessed with uh, infinite space, apparently, uh, in their glass houses. And they, and they keep building, by the way. They've added more. And <clears throat> uh, the only way to take this picture, to give it its real sense, is to take it down the center, which I usually don't do. But the, but the ground. The marble has water on it, so you get a reflection. It's quite, quite packed and uh, extraordinary. Uh, <clears throat> this is the topiary garden. And uh, what I love about it is that the topiaries are basically uh, humanized in a certain sense by all the plantings around them, and so they cease to be like soldiers, but have a, have a kind of quality of a stature because of the plantings. Uh, these are American pillars, the rambling roses. And I purposely kept the benches in the photograph to give a sense that there was a place to sit. It's wonderful when a garden has a place to sit and you can sit and smell those roses. Uh, you saw pictures of the outline of the um, of the fountain garden. Uh, this is what it looks like when you see it in the spring. And as far as the eye can see, there are flowers. The plantings are really excessive, and it's the excess which is brilliant. Here it is with more order, uh, but it's you can see uh, that. Um, the quality of it is such that you uh, are, are drawn to uh, the, the plantings and not quite the order, and the fountain is incidental. These are angels' trumpets. There's a white garden. White gardens are always wonderful. <clears throat> This reads as black and white, which I like very much. Amanda showed you 
of the image with all the color. But this is a quality about it, which I sort of love. And what's interesting, it's a tough photograph to take because if you notice, uh, the everything is in, really in focus, and yet uh, it was taken at a very slow speed. So I had, uh, to be truthful, I took a lot of photographs to get this photograph. <clears throat> This is the Italian garden from the end that most people don't see it. Most people stand up at the other end and look at it. You can actually walk in the garden. Very few do, but I got there and I realized that the frog is really watering everything. Uh, Longwood has everything. I mean, <laughs> you can't, they, there, there are, uh, in the glass houses, there are bonsai and so forth. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, it's, it's, uh, at a certain point, you get exhausted by the variety. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I love this photograph of the trees. I just love the trees. And what makes the photograph, uh, from a photographer's point of view, is that the, the, the strong trunks are off to the left, and the branches are, have enormous movement, and sort of, because, of, because they're not large, really, uh, but they stretch out. They, they make the, the trunks seem much broader and stronger and, 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 uh, and mighty in a way that they would otherwise be. Again, I played with the trees. And uh, this is deceptive, but there is at the far end on the left another uh, Kusa dogwood. So it looks like it stretches on forever. Uh, and I purposely framed it so that I had the trunk at one end and the other tree at the other uh, extending the branching. I, I was given a, a house at uh, Longwood to stay. I went down uh, every two weeks and I spent about three days there for over a year and a half. And one night I was out uh, drinking some wine and I looked at the sky and I said, oh God, I have to stop drinking and take a picture. <laughs> so I ran down the road to get this. <laughs> the light was just too good. You couldn't, couldn't believe it. Uh, this is at Hagley. And uh, Hagley is relatively small, the house is, but this is the house and, and the business office was built in 1835, but they gave it the name of a grand English manor. That's how they got to it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> they had a sense of themselves even at the beginning. Uh, I love this barn because this is a real American story. The family uh, built the barn first and moved in with the animals. And uh, that's the way of life. Uh, this is, uh, it's built in such a way that you can drive up. It, it's, uh, you can see the, the various levels so that there are uh, no stairs. You can drive your wagon all the way to the top. There's a story in this. This was the original alley. And you drove down this alley to the house with your horse and cart. When the automobile came into vogue, and, uh, and was persistent, uh, <clears throat> they moved the driveway because the lights drove everybody nuts from the house. So uh, this alley stands, uh, but is just not used by anybody other than photographers. Uh, this gives you a sense of the industrial nature of the area. It, it's, it's quite beautiful now, but they were making gunpowder. Let's understand that, okay? And if you look at the building there, that building is backwards. Uh, <clears throat> you enter there, but uh, all the, it opens on the other side by the river because they were keeping, they were keeping the gunpowder there. So if it exploded, it wouldn't explode on this side uh, where people were working and where the railroad was, it would explode on the river side. Uh, this is another view of uh, the, um, the folly, and 
And it, it was well imagined because although it's Italianate, they used these great uh, cauldrons, uh, which were used for making gunpowder as part of it. And so they, they melded uh, in, a, in, a, in only an American way, an Italian folly with your industrial heritage. Uh, and there's the river uh, showing you its power. There, the one photograph that uh, Martyr showed you of the river roiling there was taken at a moment when there was a great storm and, uh, I, and, and there was a flood. And I went down there to take uh, photographs of it and I was told that you wouldn't see anything like that again. It was a 10 year storm. And a month later, they had another storm which was worse and flooded the museum. So we are in changing times. Uh, this is a sense of uh, what was there. Uh, the mosaic was made by workmen that had taken pictures of it and had blown it up to size so they could reconstruct it uh, in the way it had been in Italy. Um, this area here has been repurposed. Uh, those are Saul Peter vessels, apparently. And they, uh, they marked the stairway to the, uh, to the neoclassical garden. There was a garden on the other side of the waterway, uh, which was a neoclassical garden. Um, this also gives a sense of what was there and, and uh, the river. And uh, this was also planted. And you can see uh, that uh, <clears throat> the, these flowers are not replanted. This what was there 100 years ago. Um, so all the trees and the plantings are, are over 100 years old, uh, older, uh, but they've come back. And that's why it would be wonderful to be able to uh, have people be able to visit it again. Okay, American Eagles, they came over on the Eagle, and so we're now in Mount Cuba. This is Mount Cuba's gate. Jeff will be talking about Mount Cuba. Um, this gives you a sense of the formal garden leading off of the, um, of the house. I think of Mount Cuba as a series of uh, concentric rectangles. Of course, the family planted around the house. This is the pool. And it's uh, Barry and Coffin's design. She was friendly with everybody in the family. And so she was fully employed uh, by everybody. Um, and uh, it, it's called the, the round garden. Uh, this is me playing with it. Uh, the muley grass, I told my wife we should have in our garden, um, and I'm waiting for it to turn white. Uh, but there is, the, uh, there, is the, uh, there is the pool, but I took it over and I sort of brought together all the plantings so you can see how they all relate. <clears throat> sort of bringing it all together, uh, it's, a, it's a vision that the photographer can have. It's hard to see it when you're walking through. Uh, this has a cathedral aspect to it, and it's near the, their pond. The trees are wonderful, and there is the early morning fog. Again, there's plantings in these woods. Uh, these, uh, these straight as arrow trees are tulip trees, and in the 19th century, uh, these straight tulips were used for making uh, ship masts. Um, if you plant them too close, they branch out. Um, this is an autumn, autumn dogwood and, and grasses. Uh, they have a meadow at Mount Cuba. So as you go away from the house, you start to get, uh, you get, you get a, a sense of uh, more freedom. And uh, 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 these are lady slippers, which I sort of love that I love the quality of the, uh, the bark. So uh, the, uh, the, the delicacy of the flowers and the uh, sort of geometry of the bark. Um, this is an old, uh, probably uh, early um, 
a 19th century uh, abandoned house on the Mount Cuba grounds. They have all this na native grounds. And <clears throat> so you can see that the style uh, was very similar to the style uh, that was used in the building of the, uh, the business office and uh, more like the business office than the, than the, the barn, which was, uh, which was much more carefully done. This is a native pond uh, at Mount Cuba in the native lands, which Jeff will talk about. And uh, this is their wonderful pond, which gives you a sense of the, the plantings. And it's, it's not a natural pond. They built it. And you can see the bridge all the way in the far corner. Uh, OK, that's the end of my talk. And uh, uh, I think we should, we'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to uh, Todd to uh, make further introduction. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so I have been left with an odd feeling that is somewhere between delight and envy. Um, I think I might have to get that checked out. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Larry and Marta, for your amazing and beautiful images and words. Uh, that really is one of the most important collections of gardens, not only in America, but in the world. Um, and I really feel uh, that we have sort of, I have learned more about them than I knew, and, and I'm just enticed to go back and visit again. We're lucky today to have Jeff Downing, Executive Director of Mount Cuba with us. Um, and I'm gonna start off by asking uh, Jeff to talk a little bit about himself, and a little bit about Mount Cuba. Hi, Jeff. Jeff is a former colleague from NYBG. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as Todd mentioned, uh, my career in botanical gardens started right here, um, almost uh, to some extent in this very room. I, my first job in botanical gardens was here as the manager of student services. And one of the uh, um, responsibilities I was told as uh, our, the winter lecture series was approaching was uh, to be in charge of the control room in the lecture hall, which had a bunch of um, far more antiquated equipment at that point in time. And uh, so I got to sort of do the lights and run the AV and things like that. And one thing led to another. And um, I ended up uh, eventually uh, being vice president for education for some period of time, uh, about five years. And then the opportunity came to go to this little place that I had sort of heard of but didn't know much about called Mount Cuba Center. Um, I knew a former colleague here, a former director of the School of Professional Horticulture, Julia Lowe, had left here to go to this place, uh, Mount Cuba Center, which all I knew about it was it had some native plants. It, it was somehow related to the DuPont family. Um, and it otherwise was, was kind of unknown. And, and it was partly because it just wasn't open to the public at that point. Um, the Copeland family, uh, Lamont and Pamela, were uh, close relatives of um, essentially all of the other um, families featured in the public gardens of, of the Brandywine Valley. Um, and uh, Mr. Copeland was the last member of the family to run the DuPont Company. He was president and chairman in the, the middle of the 20th century. But uh, as uh, Marta and, and Larry mentioned, uh, they, uh, they built their house in the mid-1930s, and they immediately started planting it. It was kind of like a, a DuPont uh, thing that, you know, when you had your house, you started planting gardens. Um, but they became more and more enamored of native plants over time. And uh, as Marta mentioned, by the 1960s, the Copelands had already uh, decided they were going to focus their gardens on plants that were native to the region. And they'd already decided that their house would eventually someday become a public garden upon their passing. And they started putting things in motion. They even won a, an award from uh, the predecessor of the APGA, the American Public Gardens Association, in the 60s for their foresight in, in public gardens, even though it wouldn't be a public garden for almost another 50 years. Um, but they, they planted out their gardens, both formal and naturalistic, as you saw in the photos. And, and they just kept focusing on that. And uh, Mr. Copeland passed away in 1983, just after they had hired the first director of Mount Cuba Center, who was uh, Dr. Richard Lighty, a very uh, well-known and uh, excellent 
plantsmen and horticulturists, started the Longwood graduate program at the University of Delaware with Longwood. Um, and, and kept making plans for this for this public garden, um, uh, and then Mrs. Copeland lived to her mid 90s and passed away in 2001. And it's just been since then that Mount Cuba has been working towards becoming a real public garden. For the first 10 years, it did about the same things that it had been happening there while Mrs. Copeland was alive, having. Um, just uh, a couple of tours a week and maybe some garden club people and a couple of maybe Trillium enthusiasts. Um, but it, it, around 2012, they started thinking that they, they really wanted to um, make good on what grandma, you know, had wanted that, and make it a real public garden. And, and uh, because it, it uh, has a... Uh, was founded with a, a fairly substantial endowment. They, they had the unique opportunity that they, they didn't need a fundraiser for their executive director. What they needed was somebody with a programming background who could help activate the place and, and uh, kind of make it worthy of its mission. And so they looked around and they ended up finding me up here in the Bronx um, running programs of all different so kinds, all the amazing stuff that happens here. And uh, I was lucky enough to be able to go down there and help uh, open it up for general admission in 2013, establish a certificate program in uh, ecological gardening um, and just a, a far more robust uh, education program. Um, we've developed conservation programs and uh, research programs. Our, our uh, native plant trials um, have been very helpful to both consumers and the industry in, in helping select plants that are uh, native plants that are going to be highly successful in gardens and also attractive to pollinators and, and uh, other wildlife because part of our trials is to see not just which plants grow the best or look the prettiest, but which ones are, are attracting the most pollinators and things like that. So that's essentially how we got to where we are and, and now it's uh, you know fully public and, and uh, part of this amazing group of gardens. Uh, thank you. It really is a, not just a beautiful garden, as you saw in Larry's images, uh, but it's an extraordinarily important place because, as Jeff said, it was um, very far ahead in the sort of our uh, kind of journey towards incorporating native plants more thoughtfully into our gardens. Um, and it's wonderful in contrast with those grand other gardens that the DuPont family has put together in the region. Um, so Marta, you're obviously a, a wonderful writer with a kind of broad uh, knowledge of and interest in gardener, gardens, not just here in the US, but kind of over history and around the world. Um, how do these five gardens fit in the pantheon of American gardens, um, and how do they fit in the pantheon of international gardens? So it's really interesting when you think about the concentration of gardens in this fairly limited area. So I haven't exactly measured it, but let's say it's about 10 square miles. And of that, you know, this is 3,500 acres of public gardens. It's really significant because, you know, in addition to creating all these gardens, each of these individual DuPont families said, we want to save these and open them to the public. So I think that's fairly extraordinary. In terms of just their importance, you know, of the similar geographic spots around the world, I'd say, you know, maybe the, the hill towns around Florence, you know, Florence and the hill towns around it, that has that sort of concentration. Maybe like Sussex and Kent, right, in the south of England, where you've got gardens like Great Dixter and Sissinghurst and like that. I don't know, maybe... Um, Suzhou in China, you know, maybe Kyoto, right? So it's, I think, among those, uh, you know, we can argue for New York City. You know, we can say we have the New York Botanical Garden and an Untermar and Wave Hill. We can argue for the Bronx. Yes, but, we can. You know, this it, it's one of those. So let's just put it that way. Is that all right? <laughs> Well, thank you. Actually, uh, I had some colleagues from other gardens in New York City um, who accused me of being a turncoat for participating in this whole event. <laughs> um, uh, but I am a lover of gardens uh, at my heart, and I am willing to allow other gardens to get a brief spotlight in the stage at NYBG. Um, so Larry, uh, just uh, full disclosure, Larry and I have worked together um, uh, here at NYBG for a long time, um, and I'm very familiar with Larry's process. Um, but I think the 
audience would love to hear a little bit about how when you enter a garden that you've never been to before, and now you've been to a lot of gardens, um, how do you break it down as a photographer to understand how to best represent it in your images? It's a tough question. <laughs> uh, and tougher one. <clears throat> well, contrary to what most people do, I, I like to start, if I'm going to be doing a project, I like to start in the winter. Um, <clears throat> you see the bones, you see the structure, you understand the light, and it makes it easier to sort of gradually get into it. The other thing is this, that the rest of the year is a surprise. And it's delightful in that way. So you'd never get jaded if you start in the winter. Uh, everything is a glory after that. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one of my secrets. The other is uh, that uh, I like to walk around, and I'm very much interested in the trees. The trees always attract me. And, uh, and I, I don't care the time of day uh, because if, if there are enough trees, uh, you're, you're under the trees and the light is always filtered and interesting. So I don't mind shooting even in midday, which most people don't do. And the other thing is, uh, I like to see if there's a story here. Uh, are you moved to move from one part of the garden to the next? Does it reveal itself? Uh, does it are there places to sit? Uh, is this a, a walking garden? Is this a garden that gives you a journey? Uh, is this a garden uh, that has a secret area, an area where you can sit and contemplate? So those are the kinds of things that I look for, I look at, and, uh, and then I, I have a sense of the place. And in this case, I had five very, very diverse gardens all over the place, but within a really short distance, 15, 20 minutes, I could get everywhere. So uh, I also try to get there at different times of day so that each garden gets a chance for me to see it in, in different lights. So that's my process in a way. Thank you for that. I, I will say that uh, we've had many garden photographers take pictures of this garden over the past nearly 130 years. Um, and when we were looking to create a book uh, that celebrated the beauty of our trees, um, we had all of the big name garden photographers come and sort of show us uh, sample photographs. Um, and none of them really captured the light, the character, the mystery, the depth, um, the things that those of us who love our trees just feel innately when we see them. And here we have a mergers and acquisitions attorney of sort of who came and sees these gardens um, and in completely new ways. Um, and I saw that with these pictures, Larry. They really, it's I've seen all of these gardens before, um, but through your photographs, I always see these spaces in a new light. So it's really brilliant. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, you said something pretty funny in your presentation. I heard Marta chuckle. Um, you were referred to them as the five families. <laughs> and uh, it does have sort of an organized crime feeling about the whole thing, I got to say. Um, uh, and so my next question is... Actually, you know, they, they owned... Um, <clears throat> the DuPonts owned General Motors, by the way. Yeah, they controlled well, yeah. it. So, and they had to get rid of it. Uh, and that was through, because they were a chemical company, I think it was through their seating arrangements and just... Uh, having to furnish the cars, they wound up with control. So they were a family that was very aggressive. <laughs> well, clearly grandeur has to come from something ill-gotten. That's my uh, uh, deeply held belief. Um, but with that in mind, uh, grandeur on this scale, um, except for Mount Cuba, of course. Um, uh, so, so Marta, I'm going to ask you, you're a wonderful historian, you have a great imagination, you know, you enter the minds and the lives and the perspectives of the subjects that you cover. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to imagine, I guess it's Alfred, Pierre, Henry, Francis, and Lamont, um, who weren't necessarily contemporary, some were, some weren't, gathering together at a picnic at Point to Point, which is some horrible thing that they do down at DuPont every year, um, to discuss gardening. What does that conversation look like? Uh, well, you know, they were competitive. 
Well, first of all, Alfred wouldn't have been there because there was a real falling out in the family and no one would talk to him. Uh, that's a very long story that I mostly avoid because Elizabeth, where's Elizabeth, the, the, the editor, said, you know, you get, what was it, 2,000 words per garden? I mean, can you imagine writing about Longwood in 2,000 words. I mean, you can just about name all of the different things they've got. Anyway, uh, back to your question. What they, would they be talking about? They would be talking about trees. First of all, they all love trees, right? So in like, who had the best ones? I mean, really, they, they did compete. Then they would talk about visitors. Who has the most visitors, right? Who has the best color display? And I'm telling you, sorry, Jeff, it's going to be Henry Francis DuPont because see those beautiful azalea pictures that Larry showed? He would go out every spring, of course, with the staff, right, his big staff, and he'd go, you know, those two, those colors clash. We've got to move that one. I mean, these have got to be huge azaleas, right? So it'd be like, who's got the best color combination? I've got the best bulb display. But then I think that they would just like all agree because they were a family with that little exception of the friction with Alfred. And they did really, you know, sort of honor that family tradition. And I think that's one of the great things about this book. I mean, Larry kind of played that down. But this was really the first time that I think, you'll tell me if I'm wrong, Jim, that these five gardens got together on a joint project, right? As opposed to, you know, we all go to the same committee meetings or something. Well, actually, uh, when I was the first to do it, um, the uh, man who called me said, uh, we, we'll do three, you know, <laughs> because he says, we're going to have trouble getting the other two. And I said, I'm not going to do it unless we have five. I want all That's five. the mergers and acquisitions attorney <laughs> speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, really? I said, yes. He said, okay. And then he called me back. He said, I got five. <laughs> so they had never done it together. Uh, but, uh, and this actually brought everybody together. It was really wonderful in that regard. And they worked together and they were, and they promoted it together and they now talk to each other in, in a different way. I think that's true. Well, we're, we are all the beneficiaries of their ambition, their collective ambition and drive and competitive nature. Um, but Mount Cuba, I think, fills an unusual niche within that group of gardens. Um, uh, so, Jeff, as I said before, I'm a real, we're all real admirers of the program at Mount Cuba. Um, do you feel like an odd DuPont duck? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Uh, I think, you know, as people are saying, you know, the, the gardens, they each have their own character. Um, we do share board members, too, here and there. So uh, I know Mount Cuba has board members that are also board members at Longwood, uh, we, uh, one of our board members is the president of the board at Hagley. Um, so there's, there's a, a reasonable amount of, of give and take, but, um, Mount Cuba is distinctive in its nativeness for sure. And, um, our m mission is very specific because it's not just to display native plants. It's to advocate for native plants. It's to inspire people to appreciate the beauty and value of native plants and ecological gardening and then go home and do it. So uh, a lot of our evaluation of our program is goes beyond just, you know, are the gardens beautiful? Uh, are we having classes and are people coming? It's, it, it's in many ways, are people going home and using the information to go and plant native things in their yards? And can we demonstrate that it's having an impact on wildlife because one of the things we say is you know does does nature care because if we're all planning these things and and it's not leading to any benefits for wildlife for insects bees butterflies birds 
then we're just making ourselves feel good by running around. So a lot of what we do is trying to document the benefits of, of using native plants and, and, and seeing the, the wildlife implications. And, and so we do a lot of that. But so in that way, yeah, I, I think we're different. But the, in a lot of ways, um, you know, the, there's a lot of traditions and things that carry on from garden to garden. And, and this book has been a, a really great opportunity for us to collaborate in a way that um, hasn't, and especially with respect to Nemours, because um, that was a falling out that happened 100 or so years ago. And, it still lingered in a weird way. <laughs> so um, it's, it's been nice to kind of bring the whole thing together and the, the community together. Thank you. So Larry, you said you spent about a year and a half going down every several weeks to get these photographs? Yes. <clears throat> uh, uh, I started <clears throat> as early as I could, which was the beginning of March, and um, I, I went down, uh, yes, every two weeks, and I went down for three days, uh, two and a half days. Uh, I, I spent two nights there. I brought, uh, Kitty said I was living like an assassin. Uh, <laughs> I brought my own food, <laughs> and uh, I was by myself, and I, I worked from early. I left the house to get down there. I left the house at 4 o'clock in the morning whatever it was, to get there early enough so that I could be there at the beginning of the work day. Uh, it takes about three, three and a half hours to get there. And then I would work through to, to dark. And, um, <clears throat> the, and the problem was that actually in shooting uh, the, the uh, fountains and all the lights was I had to wait uh, <clears throat> until it got dark again <laughs> early. <laughs> uh, so because it was... It was otherwise I'd be up until you know ten o'clock at night waiting for it to get dark to take pictures of the fountains which they turned on for me. <clears throat> so uh, and I always went down on the same days Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Monday it's usually uh, some of the gardens were closed. Some of the gardens were closed on Tuesday. So I tried to get there on days in which they were closed, uh, and uh, I worked all the way through. To uh, and I, I decided on two springs. That one spring was not enough because that was the first spring, and I knew I must have missed a lot because I just didn't know enough. So I went through two springs, and I ended up in June of 2022. Uh, I started in uh, March of uh, 2021. Excellent. So you said that you uh, were you, you missed it because the winter didn't work out. You, no snow shots. Any other shot that you wish you had gotten that you didn't get? No. I uh, everybody was rooting for me. So uh, uh, they Except said. Except for me. Uh, they said. <laughs> they said. Uh, I kept telling them I need this and I need that. I said I have to get some spring shots of the of the the folly. And they said, and they called me up. And said, it's ready, it's ready. And then I wanted the shots of the alley. You know, I wanted it to turn. And they said, it's here, it's here. <laughs> Come down. <laughs> it's nice to have helpful friends. <laughs> uh, Marta, again, you did a deep dive into the history of, the, of these gardens and these people. Um, any surprising bit of information about any of the gardens or any of the people that you were able to unearth? I'm looking for more dirt. <sighs> Well, I don't, I don't know about dirt, but, you know, I just placed my bulb order, and I teach the bulbs class, right? So I give myself license to buy quite a few bulbs every year, and then when they arrive on my doorstep, I think, what insane person <laughs> took over my computer and placed this order? Uh, Henry Francis DuPont, you know, as Larry said, he went to Harvard. He went to the Bussey Institute. So this was, you know, it was agriculture, but also horticulture. So, you know, he was trained. And while he was in college, his dear old dad said, you know, I'm going to let you manage, like, the estate now. And so he finally thought, I can order my own bulbs. And his first order was 29,000 daffodils. <laughs> So I now don't feel bad, except I don't have his staff. <laughs> and so that was the biggest surprise. The other thing to me now, this is totally true confessions. I had never been to Nemours or Hagley 
when I started this, when I talked to Larry and Elizabeth and they said, would you do this? I was like, okay, sure. And my interest in the DuPonts came entirely from the New York Botanical Garden, where I was interested in Beatrix Farrand and Marion Coffin. In fact, Susan Cohen let me teach my very first class about Beatrix Farrand and the Rose Garden and Alan Shipman. And so Marion Coffin, you go, okay, Marion Coffin, how did she get this job at the New York Botanical Garden? Well, she was a buddy of Henry Francis DuPont. Henry Francis DuPont was on the board. So, you know, it's like they all connected. So, you know, that was really fun for me. Uh, you know, other surprises, other dirt. I don't, you, know, you know. I think that's quite enough. Yeah, I left the, I left the family dirt out. But, you know, but one thing I'm still trying to figure out is how did Larry get a house at Longwood and I stayed at the Hampton Inn? <laughs> I, I don't know how many times I have to say it, mergers and acquisitions attorney. <laughs> Well, the answer to that is that basically it was, this was my COVID project. Um, and, and so the problem was that uh, actually it took me a little while to get started because I had to get vaccinated. So the first thing I had to do before I did anything else was to get vaccinated. And then the question was, where would I stay? And the idea of having to stay in a public inn and having public uh, food and all that was such that it was, I was taking a big risk. So I said, okay, um, <clears throat> is it possible to stay in student housing? And um, <clears throat> so Longwood said, yes, we can give you a house. It's not much, but he promised me that I had a million dollar view, <laughs> 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 which was correct. It was not much, but <laughs> there was a million dollar view. And, um, <clears throat> So that's really, you know, the story in the sense that it was the, the fact that I could work outdoors and uh, basically, uh, but I, 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 met, I had people help me in each of the gardens and I worked with Jeff and I must say this, Jeff was the only CEO who actually spent time with me in the garden except for Chris Strand who was the head gardener, but as soon as he became CEO, he didn't have any time. <laughs> <laughs> but well, Jeff, we met every, every time I came down, Jeff was there and we went, went around the garden together. And I went in his Jeep on the natural lands and I thought that it was, I was in the wild west. <laughs> well, actually that's a, that's a wonderful point because Mount Cuba, when you, when you, the images are just really do um, show the, the similarities and the differences between these gardens. And what I loved about your Mount Cuba pictures is that it really felt a little bit wild, like it was a little bit of a non-garden garden. Um, and, uh, you know, which is a remarkable accomplishment in that part of the world when you're surrounded by those, you know, Italian and just kind of impressive, uh, kind of very garden-esque gardens. Um, what's, how, how will Mount Cuba evolve now that it's open to the public? Uh, will, do, will you push more towards um, kind of maybe more traditional forms of horticulture or will you double down or quadruple down on this wonderful history that you've had? Um, so our mission, again, is about inspiring appreciation for native plants and motivating the adoption of ecological gardening practices and sustainable practices. So um, we, well, we weren't developed to follow trends. We were developed to make them. So one, when I got there, one of the first things I confronted is we uh, had three uh, board members interviewing for the executive director role. And they were the ones that were progressive and interested in like really kind of, you know, making more of the garden, getting it open and, and uh, you know, seeing it really progress. And so I imagined that that was the case with the entire board. Uh, so once I was hired and I got down there to my first board meeting and said, so that, you know, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get this place open to the public. And about half of them went, whoa, <laughs> we're not sure we want to do that. And I was like, oh, well, geez, <laughs> wish I knew that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Um, but when, when making the case and as you know, this took a, a few board meetings to, to talk through and, you know, one of the older senior board members, one of the children of the, uh, of the Copeland family, there's three of them and they're all still alive. One's still an active board member, two are emeritus. Um, one said, you know, well, what if it goes 
the way of American colonial furniture because they had remembered that there was a time where Winterthur, you know, kind of really suffered during the, the Great Recession in the, the late aughts um, as uh, the interest in, in you know, high end colonial furniture just kind of, you know, went down. And they said, well, what if native plants just like that? What if it's a fad? And I said, well, you know, then that makes our mission even more important because we're not here to follow the, the trend. We're here to, in, to create it. And so if, if it became less popular, then that would make us more, more important for us to redouble our efforts to figure out how do we get back into it, people's consciousness. So as we evolve uh, in 2020 with the COVID and people wanting more space, we opened up trails in our natural lands. We have a total of 1,083 acres. And um, you know the the gardens themselves only comprise about you know thirty. Um, there's you know uh, other estate like you know kind of you know lawns and and uh, things uh, around the house, but um, it's really about getting people out into the the more natural areas. Areas we just developed an interpretation program for those natural areas, so people can understand like what the the management programs are out there, what they're designed to do, um, building habitat and things like that. So I think that over time, you know, we will be doubling down and and continuing to figure out how to you know ensure that this uh, wave of native plants that have been very popular lately um, just infuses itself as the new American gardening aesthetic. Great. Well, we're all grateful for that. Yeah. It, it helps us all. Um, I don't know, Kay, how are we doing for time? I'm having so much fun. Uh, we could, I could be here forever. Um, um, we're good? Yeah. Great. Excellent. Thanks. Um, okay. So uh, what I love about this group of gardens is that they're rooted, they're very early 20th century. Uh, with the exception of Mount Cuba, which is uh, kind of very modern and timeless. Um, and uh, they've each sort of taken their own path. Um, so maybe, Marta, you could help us understand um, how can these gardens, these wonderful historic gardens, continue to be true to that past while evolving to kind of serve audiences that are changing in their tastes and changing in their interests? Yeah, and I, I do see in all five gardens really the move towards ecological practices in horticulture. Um, definitely still that focus on trees, you know, that Larry talked about. I mean, really from the start, you had like Longwood was acquired by Pierre because he wanted to save the trees in Pierce's wood. They were going to be logged. And there's been a tradition of that and that continues. And trees are now really, you know, they're kind of under fire when you think about the number of different kinds of trees that we've lost over the recent decades. Um, so that's really important. Education, Mount Cuba, and Longwood in particular, I think, for education in horticulture, they're educating, you know, along with people like us, the next generation of horticulturists. And I think that's really super important. Thank you. So, so Larry, uh, you know, you got the five families together. Congratulations. Um, how do you think your work and your perspective on these gardens um, ha might help these gardens understand themselves in new ways? Tough question. Uh, what I try to do is, well, um, I try when I start to look at all the photographs taken of these gardens or any garden I go to. I'm not the only one that does it, but I mean, um, you know, photographers tend to do that. You just want to see what's out there and how everybody looks at it. Um, and then what you try to do is look at it the way you would like to see it and want to see it and I want to express it. And um, there's a difference. There really is a difference between the way people walk through a garden and the way uh, a photographer will look at it because I bring together a, basically a foreground, a middle ground, and a, and, 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 uh, you know, a, a, a horizon. And I sort of bring together various elements so that it's different. It's, it's, I make the, the composition 
of the photograph is in fact a complex structure. Now, when you're used to doing it, you can see it fairly quickly and you can walk around and, and uh, your position is your point of view and you fill the frame. And that creates a, a way of looking at it, a point of view with, which expresses in a way the garden's uniqueness, its quality, its beauty. And if you do that in a way, it helps people to see their own garden as beautiful, as interesting, and, and as not something which is jaded. A lot of people walk through and say, been there, done that. But if you, if you spend a lot of time in a garden, you discover that every day is different. I mean, I've been photographing the New York Botanical Garden now for 20 some odd or more years, and I never get tired of it. I, I run down here to get invigorated, just to see the light, to see what's going on, and to have a sense of it. And so I think that the gardens themselves, uh, in their own way, they help renew us. And so I think that, you know, their vitality is really important for a part of the human experience. Mm, well, that's a really wonderful way of, of putting it. The, the reason why I ask is because when I look at the pictures you've taken of this garden, um, it's it's refreshing, it's energizing um, to see somebody who has looked at a space that I know very well um, and that I have deep and abiding affection for, um, and to see somebody else who clearly has a similar level of affection, but a completely different perspective. Um, and that's the beauty of garden photography and garden writing, right? And in many cases, you're writing or taking pictures of things that are sort of cast in stone, um, but these are living, breathing institutions. So we, you, you mentioned Hagley, um, you know, shockingly is in need of money. I don't know what, what's, what's happening in DuPont land. Um, uh, will Hagley, because of this, and I'll ask this question to you, Marta, because of this amazing work, Will, will, will Hagley get an infusion of support or interest? It is our great hope because it is a garden. You know, that part of the garden is unlike anything else I have seen in the US. I had that feeling when I went to the Lost Garden at Heligan, which is in Cornwall. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a Tresco Abbey Gardens on the Silly Isles off, you know, Penzance. I had that same feeling of this is gardens fused with sort of romance and history. But you know, it was as, it was like you said, Larry. It's they had they took this industrial foundation and out of their own brains, they did not have a designer work with them. They came up with this plan to create this, you know, sort of new Pompeii experience. I mean, it just I, I was really stunned by that garden and and well, when I, I didn't know it existed when I got down there because I was told. Well, Hagley doesn't really have a garden. That's what I was told. And I said, it's okay. It's the family seat. I have to, it has to be included. And when I got there, I saw it for the first time. And uh, I, 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 it was, it, the weather was bad. It, there was fog and it was sort of raining a little bit. And they said, gee, it's really awful for taking photographs. And I said, no, no, the mood is just <laughs> exquisite. So we're, we're in the, I'm in the right place at the right time. I had never seen anything like this. And in a way, it, my, my first sense was the poem by Keats, uh, Ozymandias, which is, a bunch of I traveled the realms of gold and many stately kingdoms seen. And it's about the fact that everything has fallen apart. And here it is, you know, I had that same experience. I knew the poem, but I never really had the experience. And when I got there, there was the experience. And so I was sort of very moved by it. And I said, well, uh, we ought to do something about this. And I said, I'm taking this place very seriously because I, and I'm, Marta also had the same feeling. And together I told them, look, we're gonna do something special here. We're gonna write about it, we're gonna take pictures of it, and people are gonna have a feeling for it, and you may be able to get enough money to stabilize it, have people be able to walk through. 
Yeah, that would be one of those gardens that you'd hope that they don't get too much money because you don't want to ruin it <laughs> by making it, you know, all the things that a modern public garden has to be, you know, yeah. and, and so that's a, it's an interesting tension. But, Barbara, you were going to add something? Yeah, just exactly right is, you know, don't do it up too much. And I think the issue is Hagley is all about industrial history. They have really a premier library of industrial history in America, and they have all of these patent models, and they have, you know, tours of the old works. And so it was really off of their kind of main mission. So we're hoping that they'll that they'll pull that. I always felt that in a way that that, uh, that folly was really part of the 1930s. And uh, when when the Crown and Shields died, I, I, my sense was that everybody was embarrassed by it in a certain way. And they let it become a ruin on a ruin. So it's a ruin squared. <laughs> and, and in a way, we no longer have that sense of embarrassment in a way because the fact is uh, we have Disney. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and it fits in a way, it fits. It gives you a sense of what people were thinking at a certain time, and, and it's, part of, it's part of our culture in a way, and it ought to be brought back to some degree. Yeah, I, I sort of agree. It's ironic that the garden that most reflects the source of the DuPont's wealth and influence is the one that least benefits from their wealth and influence, which is, is an interesting to think about. Um, so, oh, okay, <laughs> now the hook is coming. I knew that, okay, I can't move the hook. Um, well, anyway, um, again, Larry, thank you for your beautiful photographs. Marta, thank you for your, your amazing words. Jeff, thank you for leaving the New York Botanical Garden. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mount Cuba is a, an amazing place, um, and that was really a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys, and thank you all for coming. Thank you to all of our speakers. That was an absolutely fascinating conversation. I'm sorry to cut you off when it was getting a, a real uh, rhythm there. Uh, for our audience, we do have books for sale in the gallery, as well as the beautiful photographs from the the, the book on the wall, so please enjoy those. Our speakers, uh, especially Larry and Marta, will be available to sign copies if you would like signed copies after this talk. So thank you for coming, and we hope you come back to enjoy our garden as much as you just enjoyed the Brandywine Gardens. Thank you. Thank you.